Okay, hi everybody. So my talk this evening is Lord Loudoun and the Transatlantic Impact of Military Strategy and Imperial Policy Making, circa 1745 to 1757. And I'm going to be giving you a bit of a whirlwind introduction to John Campbell, 4th Earl of Loudoun, and some of his military endeavours in both Scotland and North America. Now, some of you may have seen Loudoun represented on your screens recently as one of the characters in the BBC's Blood of the Clan series, Albeit that appearance was actually not made under his peerage title, but rather under the title of Major General John Campbell, despite the fact that he didn't actually receive a promotion to that rank until 1755. Uh, so I'm just going to start off by giving you a wee bit of biographical information about Loudoun and his histo historiographical reputation, as well as the conflict in North America more generally, we're jumping into some of the military de details specifically. So John Campbell was born at Loudoun Ayrshire, Loudoun Castle Ayrshire in 1705 with close ties to two prominent Whig families, Clan Campbell and through his mother, the Dalrymples of Stair. These family ties ensured that he quickly gained place and patronage both politically and militarily. He inherited the earldom aged 26 in 1731 after his father's death. But because only 16 Scottish peers sat in the House of Lords after the Union, Loudoun was not immediately integrated into Westminster society. However, he was elected as a representative peer in 1734, which helped secure his appointment as Governor of Stirling Castle in 1741. He entered the British Army as a cornet in 1727, and again, he saw his advancement come primarily after his election as a peer. He was appointed aide-de-camp to King George II in 1743, and he was serving as adjutant general to Sir John Cope in Scotland when 45 broke out, holding the rank at that time of lieutenant colonel. Now, Loudoun's role during the 45, coupled with his success in persuading Jacobites to surrender in its aftermath, gained him the patronage of William Augustus, Duke of Cumberland, despite Cumberland's general distrust of Scots and his regular derision of the ability and reliability of Loudoun's Highland troops in particular. It was Cumberland who secured Loudoun the North American command in January 1756, after the death of Edward Braddock in one of the early battles of the French and Indian War, which was the American theatre of the Seven Years' War. The British government hoped Loudoun would provide leadership to facilitate colonial cooperation in the prosecution of the war and reverse Britain's disastrous early defeat. Conflict had ignited in North America in 1754 when competition between Virginia, Pennsylvania and France over land in the Ohio country, which is the area depicted on the map in the slide, led Virginia to send a party of militia under George Washington to defend their territorial claims. Washington's defeat at Fort Necessity caused the Newcastle Ministry to send British regulars under Braddock, marking a shift in Britain's North American military strategy that signified the failure of the policy of colonial self-defence. Now, prior to 1754, British regulars had had little involvement in conflicts in North America, which were generally conducted by provincial soldiers under the command of colonial governors. Braddock's commission, which gave him authority over all the troops and expeditions in North America, was a determined attempt by the ministry to centralise control of the conflict in the hands of an imperial agent. And this changing role of the army increasingly led officers to play a role not only um, in directing military affairs, but also in developing and advocating policies related to civilising and governing populations in the places they were active. The British Army's failure to attain all but one of their campaign objectives in 1755 left Cumberland determined to assert stronger imperial control over the war effort. Indian diplomacy 
was centralised with the creation of two new departments of Indian Affairs, subordinated to the Commander-in-Chief. In 1756, Loudoun, as both Commander-in-Chief and Governor and Captain General of Virginia, was granted two more regular regiments and given permission to raise an additional 4,000 troops, regular troops, in the colonies, as Britain significantly increased its military commitment. Britain was fighting a cooperative war with the colonies, and army officers and ministers believed that it was the colonists' duty as British subjects to fully support that war effort. However, although Loudoun's commission gave him military authority over the colonial governors who were required to assist him, nothing could force colonial assemblies to provide the material support necessary for campaigning. And although Loudoun was granted the command in January 1756, various delays prevented him from arriving in North America until July, and he was unable to prevent the loss of Fort Oswego the following month. And the map here just shows you, it's not a very good map, I apologise, uh, but the bits highlighted, or not very clear map, uh, the bits highlighted show you where the main action was in 1756 and 57. You can see Fort Oswego down in the bottom left corner and the military headquarters at Albany, right down on the bottom here. So Loudoun was recalled in December 1757 after presiding over the worst campaigning year for the British army during the entirety of the war, abandoning an expedition against Louisbourg and suffering significant defeats at Fort William Henry and at the German Flats. Now his short tenure and his poor campaign record led early histories, historians of the French and Indian War, as well as some more recent accounts, to dismiss Loudoun's North American command as an abject military failure and to lay claims of incompetency on him. His military record in Scotland has likewise been questioned in both contemporary and recent accounts, with emphasis placed on the failures of his Highland troops, including high desertion rates and their actions during the rout of Moy. And there have, of course, been some challenges to the charges of military incompetency laid against Loudoun. Recent scholarship following Stanley Pargelis argued that Loudoun's reform of military logistics administration laid the groundwork for subsequent British success in North America. Likewise, the work of Peter Russell has emphasised some of the success of his regulars in Scotland. And yet, Loudoun still retains an historiographical reputation as an incompetent bully. A recent study of his role during the 45 labelled him a blunderer plunderer, whilst William Nestor claimed that in the colonies he, quote, alienated most of his officers and soldiers along with the populace and waged war far more effectively against the Americans than against the French. So this talk will consider Loudoun's experiences of two aspects of warfare in Scotland and North America, the recruitment of troops and military service. In doing so, I hope to achieve three things. First, to suggest that Loudoun's military contributions in both Scotland and North America continue to be overlooked. Second, to highlight the ways in which Loudoun's experiences in Scotland influenced him in North America and how he adapted the lessons he had learned previously to overcome the specific challenges he faced there. And finally, by reflecting on Loudoun's experiences and understandings, I'll provide a couple of thoughts about what this case study tells us about the role of the army in imperial policy making. Now in June 1745, a month before Charles Edward Stuart landed in Scotland, Loudoun had received orders to raise and command the 64th Foot. Now, although the 64th was to be a regular regiment composed of Highland soldiers, its purpose was to fill the gap left by the removal of independent companies from the Highlands. Such independent companies had first been raised in the region in 1603 and had thereafter been raised and disbanded intermittently in response to the local situation. 
Most recently, they had been raised in response to a memorial from Simon Fraser, Lord Lovett, lamenting the uncivilised state of the region and the frequency of depredations. When this was confirmed by General George Wade in 1724, Wade was granted permission to raise six and later ten companies, which were eventually combined into an official regiment, the 43rd Foot, the remnants of which would of course eventually become the Black Watch. Upon the outbreak of the 45, these troops had been removed from the Highlands and were serving in Flanders. So the 64th Foot was a regular regiment, but one very much moulded on the independent companies who were irregular, auxiliary or supporting troops with a specific aim, that of patrolling the Highlands, keeping the peace there and preventing cattle thieving and other depredations. The 64th, however, were scrambled into more regular action almost immediately as word of the Jacobite advance spread. With the regiment split between Inverness and Perth, it thereafter operated largely as two separate units. And Ronald Black highlighted that when the Jacobites advanced, Ewan McPherson of Cluny and Donald MacDonald of Loch Garry, along with the bulk of their recruits, deserted the 64th. Others who were taken prisoner during the British defeat um, at Preston Pans on the 21st of September also deserted to the Jacobites. However, the raising of the regiment before Charles's landing did play a role in preventing other recruits from joining the Jacobites, and it enabled Loudoun to provide a rapid support to cope as the British sought, although of course ultimately failed to achieve, a quick end to the rising. Now, the story of the Rising itself is well known, and I want to focus on Leiden and his troops, but it's worth just emphasising one key point about how the Rising was viewed, as it is something I'll come back to. So, despite significant Jacobite support being found in the northeast and throughout the Lowlands, as well as limited support in Northern England, the 45 was characterised by the British government and army, as well as by many Lowland Scots, as a Highland rebellion. And Geoffrey Plank demonstrated that such a characterisation caused British army officers to label Jacobites as criminals who were guilty of treason, whilst also labelling the general Highland population as savages, guilty of Jacobitism and disloyalty by association. And it was this blurring of definitions that led to the increasing use of indiscriminate violence against Highlanders as the army sought to restore peace. However, despite this widespread conception of Highlanders as disloyal others, government officials recognised the need to secure the assistance of as many as possible to try and neutralise the Jacobite threat. As such, when word of Charles's landing and the raising of the standard at Glenfinnan reached British officials, John Dalrymple, who's the second Earl of Stair and Loudoun's uncle, turned to the Highlands. He granted Lord President Duncan Forbes of Culloden 20 blank commissions to recruit loyal Highlanders under Loudoun's command, and he ordered Loudoun to Inverness to work with Forbes in the wake of Preston Pans. Granted the blank commissions in September, Forbes immediately set to work recruiting for the independent companies and he was joined in Inverness by Loudoun the following month. Loudoun and Forbes sought to persuade clan chiefs to accept a commission to raise their clansmen in the independent companies. Throughout, Loudoun relied on Forbes' understanding of the local political situation and his prior established relationships with Highland elites for successful recruitment. Working together, they successfully filled 18 of the warrants between October 1745 and February 1746, recruiting approximately 2,000 troops. They also recruited further troops for short-term engagements, discharging them, quote, when the occasion for such service ceased. Now, Forbes indisputably took the primary role in recruitment, 
engaging in the majority of correspondence and negotiation with clan chiefs. Although he and Loudon did meet frequently in Inverness throughout the winter and kept in regular correspondence. But in taking his lead from Forbes as the local expert and recognising that the assistance of clan chiefs was necessary to recruit soldiers in the region, Loudon demonstrated that he was willing to respect local politics and customs in order to recruit the necessary numbers. In doing so, he did not other Highlanders in the way that many army officers and government officials did, but he did recognise the unique local conditions of the Highlands. He understood that the clan chiefs held power and authority in Highland society and believed their compliance was vital for recruiting troops. He was willing to accept this and he agreed with Forbes that patronage was a suitable, tool, suitable and useful tool for helping to keep these influential figures loyal and to prevent them from joining with the enemy. Now, the numbers that Forbes and Loudon managed to recruit in the Highlands represented a significant blow to the Jacobites, credited with hampering their recruitment efforts. Colin McLaurin, writing in late 1745, noted that the two had successfully managed to persuade a number of clans to remain quiet, while simultaneously raising several hundred men for the independent companies. Most famously, the Macdonalds and Macleods of Skye, who had both joined the Jacobites during the 15, raised eight of the independent companies, depriving Charles of approximately 800 men he had hoped would join him. And Forbes noted that the two clan chiefs had been, quote, of vast use for preventing the growth of the rebellion. Their example and influence has done much good. And as other Highlanders had flattered themselves with the hopes of their assistance, the disappointment exasperates them. And even when those with whom they were negotiating did align themselves with the Jacobites, as was the case with Lord Lovett, the negotiation itself prevented men from immediately strengthening the Jacobite army. Lovett, notorious for switching his loyalties to suit his personal ambitions, spent weeks negotiating with Forbes and Loudon, whilst considering sending Clan Fraser out for the Jacobites. As a result of his wavering, the clan did not seriously begin to mobilise until October, and it was not until the Jacobites had almost reached Derby that Lovett's support for Charles Edward Stewart was made explicit. The delay in Fraser's support contributed to declining Jacobite morale as the, Jac as the army advanced and contributed to the decision to turn back at Derby. Poor communications left the Jacobites with, quote, little or no intelligence from any quarter as they marched southwards and therefore unaware of the numbers continuing to rise in the Highlands. Lydon's working with Forbes to encourage recruitment or to persuade Highlanders to remain at home and not join the Rising gives us insight into the ways in which his perception of the Highland population was significantly different from the dominant view of Cumberland and most of the British establishment. Cumberland viewed those who remained at home as enemies who had simply not risen on this particular occasion. Loudon, meanwhile, viewed them as British subjects, demonstrating their adherence to the state by remaining at home, even if they did not demonstrate active loyalty towards the Crown by raising an independent company. And developing such an understanding during the Rising encouraged Loudon's well-known moderation in its aftermath. Now, the recruitment of local auxiliaries to aid the war effort was also an important aspect of Britain's military strategy in North America. There, Loudon called on his earlier experiences in the Highlands, relying upon the local knowledge and networks of William Johnson and Edmund Atkins, the Indian superintendents, when attempting to persuade Native Americans to ally themselves with the British. 
At the same time, he corresponded closely with colonial governors as he sought to encourage assemblies to commit to raising the requested numbers of provincials for annual campaigns. And his Scottish experiences clearly influenced his approach to the recruitment of Native American allies for the war effort. And he saw parallels in the two situations, if not in the peoples themselves. Both Highland clan chiefs and Native American leaders or councils held power and authority over groups of those populations, meaning their cooperation was vital to encourage alliance and recruitment or to secure neutrality. Recognising the importance of Forbes' local expertise during the prior conflict, Loudon chose to leave efforts to recruit Native Americans or secure neutrality in the hands of the superintendents for Indian Affairs, understanding that they were better placed to negotiate successfully. Even before his arrival in North America, Loudon had written to William Johnson to express his hope that the Northern superintendent would use his, quote, utmost endeavours to procure as large a force as can be got to act in conjunction with His Majesty's forces against the common enemy. He went on to state that he was bringing presence with him for the Native Americans and would consult with Johnson regarding how they ought to be distributed, accepting the Native Americans as distinct nations who had to be persuaded to join the British war effort and recognising Johnson as best placed to achieve this. Now Loudoun further strove to prevent colonial governors and assemblies from making their own treaties and arrangements with Native Americans. He specifically ordered Pennsylvania Governor William Denny to ensure that his colony desisted private negotiations with Native Americans and left diplomacy in the hands of the superintendents. With such orders, his to give, due to the position granted to him by Parliament, demonstrate Loudoun's role as both a military actor concerned with recruiting Native American allies and as a formulator of imperial policy that sought to limit colonial interference in an area that he believed to be under the exclusive remit of imperial officials. In utilising local expertise and negotiating with influential local figures, whether through patronage in the Highlands or gifts and land treaties for Native Americans, Loudoun demonstrated the influence of the 45 on how he approached warfare in North America, whilst also responding to the unique conditions present in different geographical fringes. Loudoun aimed to play a greater role in the recruitment of colonists into provincial regiments, although again his experiences in Scotland influenced his strategy, as he once again sought to utilise ex experts who understood local laws and customs, in this case colonial governors. Without the complications of rebellion he had faced in Scotland, or of securing alliances with Native Americans, Loudon imagined he would have a little difficulty persuading assemblies to agree to his trip requests. However, hopes that provincial recruitment and mobilisation would prove straightforward were immediately dashed. The loss of Fort Oswego in August 1756, just two months after Loudon's arrival, left Britain's interior and the military headquarters at Albany exposed. Loudon requested that all provinces raise emergency troops to counter a possible French advance, though the main burden was placed on the New England colonies where the immediate danger lay. All assemblies delayed answering Loudon's request or simply refused to comply with it, quote, considering the years so far advanced, and they were, quote, exhausted both of men and money. Whilst Massachusetts agreed to draft the re troops requested from the militia, the Assembly ordered that they be kept in reserve until definite intelligence of a French advance was received, 
which would have prevented them from providing timely aid. New York, the most exposed province, was alone in answering Leiden's request. And it was the governor, not the assembly, who authorised the sending of a thousand militiamen to Leiden, who kept them in service for just 10 days until the danger had passed. And similar difficulties beset Leiden that October and the slow response of the colonial assemblies frustrated him as he believed they impacted the campaign. His anger stemmed from the recognition that there was little he could do in such a situation to furnish the troops, vital though they were, for the protection of the interior. His early encounters made it clear that negotiation would be required for colonial recruitment to proceed. As commander in chief, with the additional powers he had been granted by parliament, Loudon expected the assemblies to agree to his requests for assistance that he deemed vital for the war effort. But his initial experiences in North America demonstrated that colonial assemblies were willing to ignore or refuse his requests for assistance if it suited them to do so. And this in turn would have implications for his own thoughts and ideas regarding imperial policy making. Leiden's initial difficulties with recruitment convinced him that he could only secure the necessary support if he sidestepped the assemblies. He therefore proposed negotiating directly with colonial governors and commissioners empowered to act on behalf of the assemblies at two general meetings he would hold for the northern and southern provinces. Here, Leiden's prior Highland experiences continued to provide a benchmark for his actions. He still sought to negotiate with local experts, as he had in the Highlands, albeit with governors and colonial commissioners rather than colonial assemblies. The former would enjoy agency and power in the recruitment process, as clan chiefs had before, but Leiden saw no role for the colonial assemblies, whose members had demonstrated that they were willing to act contrary to the imperial interest. In doing so, Loudon illustrated the widely held belief that colonial assemblies did not hold the same claim to social authority over their population as clan chiefs in Scotland. In practice, as many of the local experts he was relying upon in North America were imperial officials, his actions removed the connection with those on the ground that had proved so beneficial for encouraging recruitment during the 45. He was adapting his experiences to the local conditions he faced, but he was not always entirely successful in doing so in a way that took full account of the specifics of local politics. But taking inspiration from the failed Albany plan, Loudon requested the New England provinces raise a total of 4,000 men, but he gave commissioners the freedom to decide on the specific proportion each colony would contribute. He hoped that invoking the Albany Plan's spirit of mutual and proportionate defence would help eliminate intercolonial jealousy. Likewise, he hoped that allowing local experts to agree individual colonial proportions would encourage the assemblies to comply quicker, enabling an early start to the campaigning season. Finally, his request for 4,000 New England troops, considerably less than had been raised the previous year, was Loudon's recognition of the expense the colonies were put to by the war and an attempt to cultivate goodwill. In attempting to facilitate colonial recruitment, Loudon sought to balance what he believed were necessary assertions of authority with consideration of colonial needs and issues to achieve results. However, his attempts to use a quota system to furnish recruits did not overcome all the difficulties he had previously faced, as the commissioners failed to agree on quotas, eventually requiring Loudon to propose these himself. Further, the commissioners did not have the authoritative powers Leiden had hoped they would. 
This meant that all colonial assemblies still had to be consulted before recruitment could begin, causing general delays and leading to a refusal from the New Jersey Assembly to raise the troops requested. And this demonstrated his failure to understand and respond to the local situation in North America as successfully as he had in the Highlands. But adapting his position and expectations in response to local conditions and power structures enabled Leiden to largely meet his recruitment goals. However, he was left frustrated by the delays resulting from colonial slothfulness and he was angered by the actions of the New Jersey Assembly, which he believed deliberately impeded the service and challenged the royal prerogative. Leiden was quick to praise those who complied with his requests and he actively attempted to reduce the financial burden on the colonies, cancelling requests for the raising of provincials in August 1757 due to the arrival of regulars. However, he was also quick to register his displeasure with those assemblies that delayed providing assistance or refused to comply with his demands. But even when expressing his displeasure, Loudon was measured rather than hot-headed. He couched his disappointment with reference to the Albany plan, suggesting that such actions were a desertion of the, quote, common cause of the defence and security of the colonies, rather than framing it in terms of imperial disloyalty. When writing to imperial officials, Loudon clearly flame, framed his displeasure in terms of disloyalty. He complained to the ministry about the inaction of the assemblies and argued strongly in favour of imperial reform. In a letter to Cumberland in late 1756, Loudon suggested that the problems resulted from the assemblies controlling the salaries of the governors. He stated that find a fund independent of the province to pay the governors and you model the government, you can do nothing with the provinces. I know it has been said in London, this is not the time. If you delay it till a peace, you will not have a force to exert any British acts of parliament here. For though they will not venture to go so far with me, I am assured by the officers that it is not uncommon for the people of this country to say they would be glad to see any man that dare exert a British Act of Parliament here. Interpreting the actions of colonial assemblies as insubordinate, disloyal and contrary to both the service and empire, Loudon othered colonists in his letter to Cumberland, perceiving them as significantly different from Britons at home and marking them as a potential threat to British imperial security. Whilst he proved willing to work within the frameworks currently existing in North America, Loudon's experiences led him to urge an immediate reform of the imperial relationship. And by emphasising that such steps could not wait until the war was over, Loudon also demonstrated his concern that the disloyalty he had perceived threatened to develop into calls or action for further colonial rights and privileges. Now, another aspect, another important aspect of Leiden's military experiences in Scotland and North America related to military service or his understanding of how to utilise auxiliary troops most effectively. His troops were thought the best suited to oppose the Jacobites in the Highlands through a campaign of irregular warfare, because the majority were Highlanders, familiar with the harsh local climate and difficult terrain. The purpose of irregular troops was to weaken the enemy rather than to win a decisive battle. They relied upon surprise raids, attacking quickly and then melting into the countryside before the enemy could regroup. Leiden's troops were tasked with securing routes of communication, garrisoning military posts, disrupting Jacobite supply lines, harassing parties of Jacobites remaining in the region, 
and destroying the settlements of those who had marched south. Now his troops did of course undertake campaigns that were more reminiscent of regular warfare. A detachment defeated the Earl of Cromarty and approximately 800 Jacobites the day before Culloden at the Battle of Littlefury near Golsby. In addition, Leiden's troops successfully re relieved Fort Augustus, which was under siege by Clan Fraser in December 1745. Whilst later that same month, another detachment was defeated by the Jacobites in a skirmish at, in at Inverurie. But their primary role was one of harassment. And this was confirmed by Cumberland. In February 1746, he ordered Loudon to, quote, do all that lays in your power to annoy the rebels in their retreat, whilst HRH pursues them on to Perth from this side. The following month, in recognition of the fact that irregulars were better suited to the conflict in the Highlands, he ordered Loudon to remain there and prevent men from rising to reinforce the Jacobite ranks rather than joining with the main body of the army. In this auxiliary role, the irregulars were effective and contemporary opinion and scholarship deriding Loudon's command and his decision to retreat from Inverness after the rout of Moy fails to recognise that their benefit lay in guerrilla warfare rather than in battles or sieges. And harassment tactics were employed from the very beginning of the Rising. In October 1745, Leiden had suggested that driving away the sheep and cattle of any clans or people who had joined the Rising would be the surest way to disadvantage Jacobite families and thereby encourage desertion and dampen Jacobite morale. He believed such actions were justified as they punished the property owner who had joined a treasonous rebellion, despite also punishing the family who remained at home. However, given the level of violence employed by the army during the 45, Loudon was somewhat measured in using it as a tactic of war, informing Lord Lovett that he would take care to ensure those Frasers who had not joined the Jacobites were protected, and that he would extend this to those who had joined the Rising, but who returned to their homes within eight days and thereafter remained peaceful. Loudon assumed the central responsibility for directing the campaign of irregular warfare, not only commanding the troops, but often accompanying them on marches. Despite unsubstantiated accusations that he spent too much of his time consorting with Jacobite women in, in Inverness, Loudon was in fact often with his troops, both during the Rising and in its aftermath, as the army sought to prevent the Jacobites regrouping, punish those who had participated, and capture Charles Edward Stuart. Loudon's troops were expected to remain active, scouring the countryside for Jacobites throughout the winter months which was notably different from the regular army, which was generally sent into quarters throughout the winter months. Margaret Campbell, Countess of Loudoun, expressed concern for her son, spending so much time traversing the countryside, and particularly for proposing to spend a second winter with his men, where they would be encamped in hills without tents. She noted that Loudoun would be exposed to such, quote, hardships as the most barbarous of Highlanders are only able to support. But despite the poor conditions, Loudoun gained much experience of irregular warfare during the 45. He also gained a rep local reputation as a good, honest general, which he would retain throughout his time in Scotland. And working directly with Highlanders, reinforced his understanding of them as subjects and left him convinced of the importance of utilising local troops in specific roles when the army was campaigning in unfamiliar terrain. Now arriving in North America, the influence of Loudoun's Scottish experiences was immediately clear 
as he requested Native American allies and colonial rangers be used for scouting missions rather than British regulars. Rangers were independent companies specifically employed to engage in scouting and in irregular warfare, most often in the interior. They were often made up of frontiersmen who had experienced traversing backcountry terrain and fighting Native Americans. Although as the French and Indian War progressed, such recruits became less readily available and the woodsmanship of the rangers fell accordingly. But Loudoun utilised both groups for rec reconnaissance on numerous occasions, expecting them to harass the enemy upon the march and disrupt their supply lines, as his Highland troops had done during the 45. After the fall of Fort Oswego in August 1756, Loudoun's irregulars defended the British retreat, preventing the advancing enemy attempt attempting a frontal assault on Major General Webb at the, Germ uh, the German Flats. And again, Loudoun expressed his belief that Native Americans and Rangers were best suited to such an undertaking due to their superior knowledge of the terrain. When the British were restricted to a defensive campaign in the summer of 1757, Loudoun favoured irregular warfare rather than risking a full engagement against the French. In part, this was to avoid further losses after the debacle of Fort William Henry, but Loudoun's irregulars aimed to harass French troops on their march through the interior and isolate them from their supply train and thereby to delay or prevent an unexpected assault on Albany. And Loudoun argued that by, quote, keeping a great body of the lightest and nimblest of your people in the rear to harass them, meaning the enemy, as much as possible, you will distress them more than by fighting their main body. Loudoun believed that irregular warfare was vital for campaigning in North America and he presided over a marked increase in the number of irregulars affiliated with the British Army, from approximately 300 upon his arrival to approximately 1,000 by early 1758. And although he advocated the training of regular soldiers in irregular tactics, he continued to employ specialist ranger units and encourage the recruitment of Native American allies. As in Scotland, he believed their local knowledge and adaptation to the harsh climate and terrain made them better suited to the specific tasks associated with irregular warfare. And similar understandings would also influence his use of provincial soldiers in the colonies. <clears throat> in July 1756, Loudon inherited a provincial army from his predecessor, William Shirley, rather than raising the troops himself, as he had done in Scotland. Provincials were more akin to the regular units than to the irregular troops, but Loudoun still aimed to use them as auxiliaries to support the main army. By using provincials to garrison forts in the back country, Loudoun could provide protection from French assaults and Native American raiding parties, whilst freeing up a larger proportion of regulars to engage in direct offensive manoeuvres. And he believed that this would better suit their skills, perceived lack of discipline and inexperience. However, Shirley had facilitated the raising of the provincials on the agreement that they would act independently of the regulars on an expedition against Crown Point. Loudon was furious for putting the fate of the year's main campaign in the hands of troops that he thought better suited to a supporting role. However, when the provincials threatened to abandon the expedition en masse if they were forced to work alongside regulars, he was forced to honour their initial terms of enlistment. The situation angered Loudon as he believed his commission gave him authority to, quote, command all the troops raised or to be raised in North America, however he thought best. Further, he believed his appointment as the king's military representative in the colonies 
gave him the power to alter the terms of service for all soldiers in order to answer campaigning needs. However, Loudoun recognised the necessity of provincials for the campaign and compromised so that the issue did not impede the service. But Loudoun's model of provincials as auxiliaries influenced his planning for the 1757 campaign when he ordered a regular force to attack Louisbourg, while provincials and a smaller number of regulars attempted to defend the interior forts. As in Scotland, Loudoun sought to act fairly towards such auxiliary troops. Prior to his embarkation, he had brought the issue of disparity in rank between regulars and provincials to the attention of the ministry. He argued that it ought to be eliminated to remove colonial grievances, highlighting that he recognised the importance of provincial troops and wanted them to be willing contributors to the war effort. His actions prompted a regulation that meant far fewer provincial officers stood to be outranked by their more junior regular counterparts on joint expeditions. In response to the general abhorrence of regular discipline, he also took steps to prevent any provincial being executed by a regular officer in 1757. He hoped that leniency would have, quote, a better effect um, upon the troops than the severity of punishment. His priority was the successful prosecution of the war, and he was willing to forego the usual punishments for military transgress transgressions if moderate measures produced better results. Again, he demonstrated the influence of his prior posting, despite the different circumstances he faced in each theatre of war. But despite his willingness to make accommodations for the provincials, Loudon shared the frustration towards that group that was common in the British Army, privately complaining about their behaviour, talent and discipline to subordinate officers and ministry officials. He claimed that the army's progress had been delayed, quote, by the quibbles of the provincials. And he expressed frustration that those at Fort William Henry, quote, could not be prevailed on to so far finish the fort upon the lapsing of their enlistment period. Such actions, he warned, threatened to throw the fort into the enemy's hands. And this illustrates that Leiden believed provincials, like assemblies, were willing to sacrifice British imperial security for their own ends. Service in Scotland alongside the Highland troops had strengthened that population's status as subjects in Loudoun's eyes. However, service in North America, where he had not campaigned in the field with the provincials as he had in Scotland, failed to have the same effect and instead helped to exacerbate British colonial tensions and contributed to Loudoun's othering of the population. So to circle back to those three aims I outlined at the beginning, I'll take the first couple together to summarise my thoughts on Leiden's military career. And although his military experiences extended far beyond the two specific areas um, of warfare that I've examined today, in recruiting and utilising troops or securing the neutrality or alliance of peoples, Leiden's formative experiences clearly influenced how he approached warfare in North America. At the same time, he proved willing to work within the existing frameworks in that theatre and to adapt his approach based on local conditions and circumstances. In both Scotland and North America, Loudon proved himself willing to utilise local expertise and to negotiate with local elites to achieve his objectives. Loudon's experiences and interactions in both theatres of war illustrate a more nuanced and competent character than the historiography typically suggests. Whilst he did come into conflict with colonial assemblies and provincial soldiers, it would be wrong to conclude that these conflicts were a result of a bullying or hot-headed manner. In the Highlands, serving alongside the independent companies, saw Loudon develop a good reputation amongst Highlanders, 
which was strengthened by his moderation during the pacification of the region. He was relatively unusual in refusing to view the entire population as disloyal others, the view that drove the army's strategy under Cumberland. And militarily, despite some significant defeats for the independent companies, not least their routing at Moy in February 1746, Loudoun's auxiliary troops successfully hampered Jacobite efforts throughout the uprising. Loudoun learned important lessons in the Highlands about the recruitment and use of auxiliaries and military strategy more generally that influenced both him and the wider British army in North America and elsewhere for years to come. Such lessons played an important role in Britain's military adaptation in North America during the course of the French and Indian War and laid the groundwork for much of the army's later success. Loudoun's removal as commander-in-chief was a result of William Pitt's purging of Cumberland's allies rather than any specific failure in Loudoun's military command. And although I've only very lightly touched on the role of the army in imperial policy making today, I wanted to draw a couple of points on that theme. And Geoffrey Plank has highlighted that the 45 led to an evolution of the army under Cumberland as its purpose became less fixed simply as a fighting force, and it increasingly played an important role in promoting and attempting to implement a civilising mission in the places it was active. The case study of Loudoun demonstrates that such an evolution was not strictly tied to a civilising mission, but related to imperial governance more generally. In North America, the driving aim for the British was the successful prosecution of the war against France. The army was concerned with how best to wage war far from the central power structures of London. As a result, the colonists increasingly came to be seen by Loudoun, his successors and his subordinates in a military rather than a civil light. And frustration grew at their complaints and perceived insubordination as the British felt they did not contribute enough to the war effort and even impeded the service. Whilst military service in Scotland had strengthened Loudoun's view of that population as British subjects, service in North America had the opposite effect. Colonists' failure to meet their perceived obligations as subjects led Loudoun and other officers to question their imperial loyalty and to consciously other them, viewing them as significantly different from Britons at home. And PJ Marshall has argued that prior to and throughout the French and Indian War, the relationship between Britain and the colonies was an empire of negotiation. Immediately upon arriving in North America, Loudoun began to question whether it was this relationship that encouraged colonists to act disloyally and failed to adequately support the war effort. And although he adapted to work within the existing system of governance, he began to advocate closer regulation of the colonies. Loudoun hoped that returning power to Crown appointed representatives would enforce direct control over imperial affairs and thereby reaffirm colonial loyalty and British subjected. His advocation of such measures reflected the reforming impulses of the British state and the important role that military officers played not only as instruments of empire who implemented Britain's imperial policies, but as agents of empire who informed and influenced such policies. Thank you very much. <laughs>